Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to this week's masterclass. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, before we start, let me just say that we're having these sessions once every two weeks, and it's always on Wednesdays at 5 p.m. UK time. Make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and stay tuned as we share there all of our upcoming events. Today, we are joined by Bryn Davis, is an LSDM alumni who graduated from our Master's in Design program. Bryn is a photographer and designer and director at Indigenous, and it was his love for photography that influenced him to develop this project that he's going to present for us today, that is called Can Design Thinking Become a Method of Informing the Practice of Photography? Bryn, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and for being here, and thank you for sharing your work with us. No problem. Thank you for having me. Uh, so good day to everybody. Uh, my name is Bryn. Uh, I've worked in the design industry for over 20 years now and in photography for more than 10. Um, as I mentioned, we, I own my own small business called Indigenous. It's based in the UK. Uh, although today I live in Portugal with my wife and daughter, um, but my professionally, I'm still based in the UK. Um, and my small business has allowed me to work with both my twin passions of uh, design and photography as a multi skilled professional for all this time. Um, I joined the MA design program in July 2021. There is a couple of my cohorts on here, so Team July 21, I to JK, amongst others. And I completed the course in one year. Um, I managed to keep up with the course amongst several challenges everybody faces with remote working, uh, business commitments. And in that time, halfway, I also moved country from uh, Malaysia to Portugal as well. So uh, I'm probably a good case study for how the inbuilt flexibility of the course helps uh, to keep, uh, keep on top of your studies, um, along with the freedom of the prospectus as well. Um, when I joined, I joined as a master's for business students, which means that I could approach most of the units with my business and personal goals combined. And this helped me to create uh, a pretty clear pathway throughout all of my unit, almost all my units, with only uh, Advanced Design Lab as a standalone project. But this provided different opportunities for me, um, it's, uh, such as working with a group, uh, with some of the cohorts and also to adapt it uh, to adapt the deliverables for my role as a spatial designer as well. Um, the theme that I wanted to explore early on from the application was uh, can design thinking connect with photography? Um, my own workflow over the years suggested yes, uh, from my own brand identity, the way that I worked, my business approach, and also the ways that I uh, photographed and also operated but it gave me the chance during this master's course to formulate and articulate this much more concisely. And it's given me the confidence to work towards and promote this further as well. So now I'm gonna share with you an adaptation of my final project and thesis in uh, presentation form. And then when we're finished, we can I'll give a little bit of conclusions and also some uh, open the floor up to any questions as well. Okay. So can everybody see the screen? Yes, we can see it. Great, thank you. So design is what Nigel Cross calls the third way or a synthesis of art and science. And by extension, design thinking is regarded as the human-centered approach to creative problem solving. Now, photography does aid design thinking in visual research and documentation. But the question I came up with is, can design thinking can be of equal value to photography as well? And this first came to mind back in 2015 when I con contributed a photo essay to the Look 15 Festival. This is based in Liverpool, it's a uh, uh, biennial photo festival. And during which I also gave two event talks, the Perfect Photography Project and Ethics of Portrait Photography. Now, 
while other speakers would recite their bi biographies and portfolios in an artist context, I would often talk about word clouds, decision trees, and toolkits. In short, I thought like a designer rather than as an artist. And it was later on in the festival blog where I proposed assessing work against the brief or the conditions it was made, as you would see in other creative sectors, rather than subjective opinions on ethics and truth, which underpins much of photography's contextual theory. Overall, I've never aligned with the, the compartmentalization of photography, contemporary photography as it is, where artists don't where, tend to hide their professional practice, where professionals don't necessarily have uh, the contextual background and so on and so forth. I consider all these factors to be interdependent, uh, thinking of it much more from a, cre a design creative perspective. And my bachelor's studies in photography, which I completed in 2020, reinforced that opinion along as well. So that gave me a starting point for how I wanted to approach this master's course that I took. And it was through the culmination of that that I came to these aims and objectives to argue the case of uh, design thinking as a, as a way of informing pr contemporary practice, to intersect design thinking principles and, and tasks, activities with existing photography uh, approaches, to present my own case study, which I undertook during the course, and to introduce a new analogy in which we can analyze photography projects in a lateral manner as well. So when I was preparing the literature review, I came across a few important things. It allowed me to, first of all, consolidate my own academic knowledge in photography debates um, and compare this with design thinking theory. It also gave me the opportunity to differentiate art and scientific thinking from design, uh, reinforcing what uh, cross calls is the third way. And it informed the terms of formal observation methods in academic research as well. However, there was very little written on photography in design thinking. And this, to my knowledge, was at the time of writing the first academic project that investigates design thinking in photography itself. So for me, the takeaways included that several theorists position photography as art or technology. Uh, usually with a bias towards one or the other, rather than as a third way. The impact of the digital image and the democratization of technology, which actually is something that reinforces over photography history. Um, that there's particular key points in history where the consumer base has um, threatened the, the feeling of photographer as professional or, technic or as technician. Projects are also more autonomous and self-directed through the democratization of technology, where people are also depending less on qualifying bodies, mentoring and oversight. There's not a industry, um, let's say in, in legal terms, like the bar to pass with a few professional exams, which is mandatory to actually practice photography in professional contexts. And then also the photography needs new tools to research, develop, and assess in order to create new informative ways of seeing as well. So then from that point, I took those findings and the original aims and objectives, and I basically developed from six uh, separate parts. The first one is to intersect design thinking principles. Um, and then I case studied a lot of existing photographers' work through photography and concept, ideation, happy accidents, anti-photography failed images. And then before I presented my own case study and then a way to um, use design thinking approaches to find a way to assess and validate work as well. So the, the part of uh, design thinking photography, first of all, is to contextualize the intersection of design thinking, which is the point in which desirability, feasibility, and viability meet. Now, in a photography context, that desirability would be the human need or want to photograph and or be photographed. The feasibility is within, the technical feasibility is within the means of available technology and the accessibility of the subject. And then the economic viability 
uh, is the spatial, temporal and financial resources required to undertake the task. So that could be something as simple as requiring a studio to do portraits, to access to a uh, forbidden area of photography, like uh, in a private in, in private uh, property, etc. as well. And then another part of that is also to acknowledge the photography, both the camera and the user have periods of divergence and convergent thinking. So diverging about creating choices. In the case of a photographer, will often take more than one photograph um, of a subject. And at the same time, the camera is constantly calibrating or recalibrating itself manually or automatically to determine things like exposure or depth of field or shutter speed and so on and so forth. So there's always multiple opportunities, multiple choices. And then the photographer has to converge to make choices for that, to, that photograph, photograph that they want to make to be definitive. And then also to contextualize the core activities of design thinking with photography. So the interweaving of ideation, inspiration, implementation is a non-linear approach uh, in which ideas, trial and error, and then concepts or presentation is brought together. In the case of photography, that's very much, inspiration can be anything from uh, being inspired by a particular photographer's style, uh, to discover your own techniques, to explore, to do either academic or visual research to into the subject that you plan to photograph or to understand better the types of uh, subjects that you're going to photograph, uh, and especially in the case of people, which would uh, require empathy as well, amongst other things. And then in terms of ideation, it's a chance to experiment, to create, to fail to iterate and develop ideas. Um, for a lot of photographers like to show you their, their final work, not the work that gets them to that point. There's plenty of uh, things that end up in the, in the garbage, in the virtual garbage bin of uh, Lightroom and other programs to uh, highlight this. And then implementation. So that involves anything from curating. So that's the selection of images within the edits, but also the selection for uh, presentation also delivering a body of work that is expected commissioned or for exhibition, publication, etc. The distribution of that through social media, through uh, public, uh, literary publications, etc. as well. Feedback, what we get now in particular through social media, but also through uh, personal comments, uh, through uh, people who buy, buy your publication, buy your prints, etc. And then to evaluate the successes and failings of the work that you've done. For example, uh, also by entering things like photography awards or critiques as well. And so then once understanding all the different uh, design thinking principles, the core principles of design thinking in a photography context, the next step was really for me to look at existing work and to see how that actually um, can be identified. In, in some of the things. So the first one I looked at was photography and concept. So this is a photograph by Japanese photographer and architect Hiroshi Sugimoto. It's um, part of one of his most famous series called Seascapes, where he divides the, the, screen, the sea and the sky in a 50-50 division. And he's basically ideated the same thing based on a conceptual framework for up to 40 years now, I think it is, since 1980. Um, and in that time, the, the seascape has evolved, the idea has evolved, but the core principle of where he came from, it still exists. He has adapted the, the context behind it. Um, and in particular, when he's photographed things that don't fit, fit his conceptual framework, he's then come back to this later on uh, after a period of incubation in his archive. And then simply done things like in the case of this one, this is uh, a later series of his called Revolution. Uh, where he simply crops and rotates 90 degrees with a new context, conceptual context behind it. Um, some other of his projects could also um, involve things like photographing architecture out of focus, or as he calls it, twice infinity. And of course, in, in the artistic context, sometimes the language is a little bit more pretentious than uh, the practicalities of design. But it's very much uh, 
a, a, an element of challenging conventions of what you would expect in the case of here a seascape or a landscape image to transform it in a different way of seeing um which is relative to his conceptual framework and then after that i considered ideation and happy accidents now this is a, a series by a photographer british photographer called paul graham who um, in his initial uh program was to create a a, bo a, a body of work called american night which is to understand the the social and structural divide of uh, of the American society, and it was through the accidents, accidental overexposure of one of his images that he actually found the aesthetic to communicate. Um, in this case, uh, this body of work, um, people who are living on the periphery of society and are, are technically blinded from society. So he is actually politicizing exposure control of the camera um, to to inform his aesthetic, and that comes from happy accidents or you know accidental failure uh, within that and then from there that actually juxtaposed with the second part of his series which is the picture perfect middle class suburban america so and, and a third series of that uh, was on underexposed dark exposure of the urban interiors as well so this is a way where ideating different visual techniques um, gives you an opportunity to create visual styles to contrast within a body of work and also to embrace the fact that mistakes can actually lead to insightful moments that you can uh, create bodies of work from technically failed picture perfect images when the context of the message is uh, relevant to it. And then likewise here we're having moved from accidents involving into strategy there's the deliberate failure or inverting the status quo of certain works. In this, in this case of uh, German photographer Uta Barth, she uh, continually does a lot of work with um, diptychs and triptychs, where she does the, um, the negative version of the same image that she took uh, in side by side and juxtaposition. And the, the, the goal within that is, a poor part of it at least, is to embrace the fact that the, ori the originality of photography in, um, in film form is that the negative is transformed into the positive image that we see. But actually the negative image can also have a contextual value if it's relevant to the subject and, and uh, is regarded as a technically failed image at the same time. Similarly here with also with German photographer um, Thomas Bachelor. And in the case of this, uh, again, embracing the anti-photography and failed images uh, meant, uh, approach here. Now, failed images is defined by a guy called Ernst von Alphen as when a photograph is no longer a snapshot or the picture perfect image that your smartphone would make or the automated process within your camera will aim for if you're not shooting manually. Now, within that, fa a failed image can be anything from uh overexposure underexposure out of focus uh blurry when it was unintended but it can also be in the case of uh also embracing anti-photography where you invent your own techniques and tools in this case what he does is he um converted a, a transit van into a pinhole camera um to redefine the the concept of not only the travel image uh because he takes the car on a journey and this is the abstraction of the road trip um but also that it becomes a an abstraction or vanishing point which is a in the end a man-made uh, visual identity endeavor as well and then continuing with the theme uh we also have uh the case here of uh american artist megan Ripinoff, where she uh uses photogenic paper to uh to chart uh tidal patterns in her local area and then where that comes into play in design thinking context is that it's a way of visualizing data through photography so in this case she's actually uh, visualized through both photogenic photographic image and also the collage uh, presentation uh, a way of visualizing uh, scientific data as well And part, all part of anti-photography and failed images is very much about testing rules and breaking rules. 
in this case with Japanese photographer Dado Moriyama, the whole uh, uh, method here is that the 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 of the the feeling of anti photography is that photography is basically um, rebelled against as a form of rebellion to the message that the uh, that, that that is being proposed at this time. So Dado Moriyama is part of uh, what was known in Japan as the the provoke movement in the late late sixties early seventies which was very much against the demodernization the modernization and westernization of Japan Japanese culture and in this case uh Dado Moriyama's uh seminal work by by photography is all about pushing and pushing against photography to the very limits and this is very important because on the one hand uh we when we talk about photography needing uh, like with design thinking needing rules to play without it descending into anarchy, as Tim Brown says. We also have to acknowledge that legibility doesn't always mean, it does not always uh, stand for communication. As David Carson says, just because something is legible doesn't mean it communicates the, light, the right message. And he, he refers to this quite a lot in typographical, where he's part of the, let's say, anti-Helvetica movement of the 80s and early 90s um, in graphic design. Where, where you went from a very standardized Swiss, Swiss style to a anything goes almost model, uh, inspired also by postmodernism. So after reaching a point of uh, seeing certain, certain valid points within existing photography works, I wanted to use a case study to basically show my process which uses a lot of design thinking tools and tasks and how that gets to this point. So I basically chose the, the memorial to the murder, uh, murdered Jews of Europe in Berlin, Germany, uh, for several reasons. One, uh, because it actually inspires my two interests, which is spatial design and photography. Um, it has the two, two of the primary subjects in photography practice, which is people and place. Uh, it's a very complex space when, once you dig into it, because there's several contrasting opinions uh, where, about the validity of the memorial itself, its appropriateness to be photographed, its appropriateness as a memorial itself. It's regarded as a counter monument in, um, in modern sculptural speak, um, which is something that goes from being a, a place of commemoration to a place of experience. Um, which which is part of the in, inform the part that informs my photography practice is that you're experiencing it through photography. Now it also in, in, you know it raises important factors as well in the sense that from a professional point of view, I wanted to to approach this in a very professional manner, but also recognizing that this is not a commercial project, um, that it would be insensitive and unethical to to see it as a, a project that can be commodified at the same time, but it still required best practice to request official consent and to formalize that. And that I did through the, uh, the Stiftung, which is the, 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 the Memorial's um, uh, foundation uh, with uh, official access so that everybody was aware of what I was doing with my intent. And I kept them up to date throughout the whole process. Um, and it also gave me an opportunity to uh, extensively review the memorial itself before I photographed it. So in the case of that, I did a literature review to understand the complexity of the space from the architecture's point of view to also the political, social uh, sides of it as well. And also to conduct uh, visual research into Holocaust memory uh, to see what other photographers have done projects on that, how they've approached it, what was their way of reconciling doing such a thing. Um, and also to to see what kind of photography is being taken there. And, and amongst other things is things like rule breaking, uh, is, uh, for example, climbing, standing, like you can see in this image. Um, and also that uh, it is a, a place where a lot of people do uh, selfies and things. And this is uh, actually being, uh, satira, satira, being made into a satirical thing with a German uh, comedian who actually made a website on people uh, do, uh, doing their selfies and then juxtaposing that with what he considered the insensitivity of doing, of uh, posing and 
uh, doing yoga poses or juggling and things like that. So it gave me a much more informed approach to photograph the area in a professional context, not just for fun, but also to understand the complexity behind it as well. And then to prepare for this, I, uh, I started several design thinking tasks. Some of them were also tasks that I developed myself, like this one. Uh, this is, the, this is what, what I call the artist residency canvas. Uh, it's based on, or it's inspired by more to the point, uh, strategizes the business model canvas um, in, ten, in terms of being able to ideate ideas. Um, and this was actually developed in the uh, design innovation module that I worked on earlier on in the course. And the idea behind it is uh, for people who have limitations to uh, attend formal artist residencies, uh, and also somebody who inspired me, which is a, uh, a lady called Lenka Clayton, who developed the idea called the Artist Residency in Motherhood. This is a way of turning, uh, of ideating residency ideas, which are not, on a f not formally working with an, an organization, but a way of concentrating your thoughts into a way that you can uh, formulate what you need to do a, either a period of research or a creative body of work or some some uh, some um, ideation sessions with what you need so that what you want to do the desirability with the feasibility what you need spatially financially temporally uh, what's the problems to making it viable and then the proposition is the resolutions behind that so in my case a lot of uh, the spatial needs was the ability to be on site to go there uh, within that I, I had to ask questions like, um, well, to my wife, can I go, go taking photographs for a week? Um, do we have sufficient support, uh, childcare support while, while I go, go and do it? Um, can I get a hotel nearby? Do I have the financial means to do so? Did I set a budget, et cetera, et cetera? And eventually you come to the resolution, which is the where, when, uh, how, and for how long, and you're, of course, the, the budgetary things. So you go from here, which is the why, through the, 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 the problems, and then come to your resolution here. So this was a way of managing the project from my point of view. And then beyond that, I also uh, engaged in three more conventional design think activities, namely the context map, which gave me an understanding again between those who, uh, who have appraisals of the, the memorial itself, uh, people in the media, historians, academics, religious figures, politicians, excuse me, politicians, and that, that equally has uh, as many uh, critics. And then the people that I would largely be direct, uh, working with is design. I actually uh, got some, uh, some responses from ASM and architects who uh, design the space. Uh, during the research phase, uh, together with operations such as the securities. And then on top of that, also the public and visitors, which I would not be able to uh, account for, but they will be there at certain times of the project as well. And then I also created a mind map so I could start to think about uh, how to organize what I wanted to photograph. Sorry. Um, so for me, the two things that came struck to mind was the space itself, um, which is the architecture. And then from within that, we have the behaviors, which is uh, the social engagements uh, that people have there, and also the rule breaking as well. Um, within the architecture, there is ar uh, abstract concepts, um, two main ones, which, which, the, uh, which the architects Peter Eisenman came up with which is he wanted, he wanted to create a field of otherness and also that people would be lost in space and time. Now, what I wanted to take from that is to think about counter photography ideas that uh, complement the abstract concept of, um, of a counter monument. And then outside of that, there's the design of it itself, which is that it's based on a grid structure. Um, and that it's, it's very photogenic in a kind of modernist way. Um, so that includes things like vanishing points, the topography, 
Um, and then I had to consider other things. It's in a dense urban environment in the city center, so the surrounding areas. And then also to think about the inside and outside of that as well. So I considered the inside and outside to be almost like a secondary approach. And then I went on to the behaviors, the social engagements and rule breakings um, to see that the same way as well. So there is a certain amount of uh, social engagements that people have uh, on the interior of the space. Uh, some people who treat it more like as a park as much as treat it as a memorial. Uh, it's a place to congregate uh, and so on and so forth. And then there's also a difference between how people act on the inside as they do on the outside. So that also involves uh, things like rule breaking. So understanding what the rules and regulations were, that was also part of uh, engaging with the memorial space before I actually went there to know the rules. Um, and from my own point of view as a photographer, not to contrive or provoke bad behavior, but also to recognize if it is there as well. And again, it gave me that point to consider inside and outside. So already I had created two different approaches, the architecture and then the social, so that's people in place. And then I'd already considered that there's two different approaches for each one on the inside and outside. And then finally, I also developed a, a mood board of ideas. I photograph mostly in black and white, uh, particularly for any research or commercial projects, fine art projects, etc. cetera. Um, I'm only photographing in color when requested. So I regarded uh, black and white as a starting point in this. And then from there, I went in, I went, once I was on site, I was able to take a divergent approach just to familiarize myself again with the space. So it was six years since I was there previously. Um, and then it gave me also free, free play to ideate different visual techniques um, and, and gain knowledge of the various routines and habits along with different things like light patterns and things like that as well. And this carried on for the first couple of days until I could understand various ideas uh, behind that. And then from, from that point, after a couple of days, I consolidated the ideas, uh, taking the, what I would regard as um, not only a convergent approach to formulate strategies, but to, to figure out common patterns, what things that I wanted to repeat, or times that I wanted to be there for certain times of uh, certain types of photography, particularly architecture. Um, and then from there, I was able to um, formulate the, the technical choices that I was making. I was uh, together with the visual style. So that I was setting myself up or calibrating myself for each uh, session that I could produce bodies of work for each in the remaining three days. And then on top of that, I also came to this point where I was understanding the observation methods um, and the kind of various levels of uh, observation methods that I was taking within that. So anything from the user control to the image value to the level of organization, you can see uh, that I created like a, yeah, more like a, a, a table uh, to, to, dif to show the differentiation between the different approaches as well. And that was, uh, that then became my kind of working document for the remainder of the time when I was photographing. Now, at the end of production, I considered the need for a new design thinking tool to assess the observation methods. Now, in general, photography is a medium that is directed by parameters. If we take um, subjectivity out of the equation and think of it on a technical level, um, from exposure control to tonal range, and even post-processing. But unlike um, competitive analogies, like say top trumps, I wanted something that would be parameter-based, but not competitive. And I came back to an analogy, which I first considered and actually proposed in the aftermath of the Look Festival in 2015, um, about how photographer can calibrate approaches for different needs. And as a result, I actually came up with uh, the graph, the analogy of the graphic equalizer. Um, 
And the reason for that is it establishes a lateral value between opposing research methods and also approaches uh, to visual styles and things like that as well. So, for example, if, uh, if somebody who is aesthetically driven is, is likely to bring this slide this way, does it still have an informative context or is it just um, eye candy, for want of a better way of putting it? Um, and of course, what you're looking for here is something in the middle so that you're not leaning too, well, too far one way or the other. And of course, that depends on the type of image that you're making and the type of and the context that you're trying to communicate. Um, and it's also about the kind of organizational me methods, how, how engaged you are with the subject. Are you participatory or are you observing? And an important part of this being a, a, of lateral value uh, for me is um, referring again to uh, Ed De Bono's work on lateral thinking is that one, one versus the other is not regarded as superior. So if we think about agency being the photographer having total control over the camera, if the context requires automation, then that is the best context for, that is the best approach for the context that you're photographing. It's not that this one is inferior because it's relying on technology. It's just if it's the most, if it's the most optimal way of getting the visual communication that you want to create. And aside from that, what this actually also provides me with is an opportunity to visualize um, feedback as well um, and the communicative value of photography. So it's almost an image within an image, uh, how you evaluate photography this way. And you can use it to evaluate uh, against viewers' opinion as well and judge that against, in my case, what I created earlier, the visual strategies. And to do this, what I did was I uh, conducted a server to test it with the case study itself. And here are the results for each one. So in the case of the architecture outside, I did take inspiration from uh, the previously mentioned Hiroshi, Hiroshi Sugimoto. Um, and the reason for this is because uh, the volume and the structure of the space is uh, is the point of interest here. So actually, in, even in a blurred state, you can get an understanding of scale through uh, of the, and the volume of the structure of the space through the shadow contrasts. And it emphasizes also the, top, uh, the top, topography. Um, and it also helps me to, as well, with all the urban elements around and the rogue artifacts to be neutralized when they're not in focus. Um, and then we get to almost begin to see this uh, abstract concept that the, uh, that the architect first envisaged, the, the field of otherness, because, because we cannot bring it into focus. We are left in a, in a, a, set, in a, a permanent blurred state. And then contrasting that with how I approach the architecture on the inside, um, now, as, as I mentioned earlier, the space is organized in a grid plan. Now, observing from a low point looking up, um, you can identify that um, within this structured uh, uh, system of columns, uh, each column is actually has an individuality to it. Uh, they are, they uh, oscillate in terms of size, scale, even um, angle, of, angle of insertion. And using this style, this uh, visual technique allowed me to create a photography survey, much like um, popular, popularized in the 1920s through people like Carl Bosfeld and August Sander, creating a systematic approach to photographing this exact same aesthetic. But by doing so, you actually get to see that they become almost a portrait of individual aisles within the, the, uh, within the memorial itself and uh, highlighting the, the, the within a, a volume of uh, structures, the individuality remains present as well. Then moving on from the architecture to behaviors, I took a much more, um, I would say, um, timeless approach with this, um, inspired very much by the, uh, the, the, the term decisive moments, which was coined by Henri Cartier-Bresson. That's less impactful today, but it, it still is an important uh, compositional tool. 
uh, as it re as it basically re uh, re reminds people that um, single images are uh, or strong single single images are basically sequences that have been uh, summarized and distilled into a sing into an image, which is what was referred to as decisive moment. From this point, I'm quite detached, um, very much staying out of the way of people. Um, and trying to avoid any performative reactions of visitors. So trying to be relatively incognito as to not, um, not, not to uh, contrive any behaviors uh, along the way, but at the same time, recognizing if there was any bad behaviors and the wider portfolio of work, there was, of course, people climbing and jumping between uh, different columns along the way. But as the one security guard reflected to me about the, the memorial is, the interactions of it are a reflection of society and therefore and as society is flawed the behaviors themselves are not perfect so you cannot let's say you, you would be guilty of whitewashing if you didn't recognize them but of course you're not there to uh, promote them as well to contrast that with the inside i took a much more engaged approach um this is much more dynamic and in keeping with the the way that people actually involved is more participatory as a result. Um, and to achieve that way, um, it's much less organized approach, um, photographing more off, off the hip and zone focusing, um, foregoing control of the camera to be more inclusive with people who are walking around and spontaneously capturing moments such as this. And this is a, a way of engaging in a kind of role play um, uh, in which the, 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 the body of work that you're creating is the kind of images that the people are experiencing whilst they are actually walking around as well. After those four formal areas, I then had, I developed four expressionist techniques. Um, the, first, the first one was using bodily action within space to abstract the memorial into a graphic image of itself. This is achieved through panning up. Um, and as a result, the structure of the, of the stay light, the columns remain legible, but displaced from natural orientations of space and time. You cannot see the end, um, the, the roads are, that surround it and so on and so forth, or any human elements with inside. And a part of this is to make the photographer, part, again, participatory within the memorial, rather than uh, observing other people's actions. And a variation within that is uh, instead of panning up is to pan between as if to uh, visualize what it's like for people who are passing through the, the different parts of the grid structure um, and caught in motion uh, again. And as a result, it's part of uh, engaging with the space as a, as a participant rather than as a third person observer as well. Then in expression C, this actually takes reference from um, the uh, earlier mentioned Thomas Bachelor's experience with Bon Voyage. So what I did here was I overrided the camera um, to allow exposure times that last for the duration of walking through the monument for uh, extended periods. And the resulting abstractions reduce it to a representation of vanishing points where you can see the overlapping attempts for, uh, for the image to draw itself. Uh, create this very, uh, very abstract, um, again, anti-photography or counter-photography uh, approach to a counter-monument. And again, these ideas of technically failed images, second, and this one uh, is, is uh, con another concept taking reference from uh, Kyungu Chun's portraits of expen ex extended uh, exposure times. So again, over overriding the camera, the shutters open while, hand while holding the camera handheld um, for up to a minute or two minutes. And as a result, you get this kind of, again, you get this out of focus, but for different intentions. So again, it's with uh, uh, the intention of being again, lost in space and time and the uh, the, the clarity of image that dissipates through um, through be, standing still doing nothing and, and to transforming it into a field of otherness as well.
Now, after uh, conducting the survey with the with the image equalizer against the case study, um, what we found that was that the uh, each strategy was generally understood by the viewer, and as such, it validated the intention of each one and the communicative value of what was delivered. In other words, that what people if if people recognise that uh, something I did was a structured activity, uh, it matches the original. Uh, let's say design strategy that, or visual strategy that I employed for each one of the different approaches. What it also um, highlighted is that there was an ability to ideate and, strat and strategize multiple ways of seeing using design thinking at the same time on the same subject. What was interesting for me was that the four experimental styles, uh, expressions uh, A, B, C, and D, have similar observation methods and the, the feedback reflects this. Um, the, let's say the principal strategies had very different approaches and there's much more contrasting between what we would see here versus what we see here, much more uh, uh, divergence in what would be shown in the lateral value. And again, if we actually go back to some of these images that we can see, if we look at behaviors, Everything seemed very detached, almost uh, emotionless, um, unstructured, disguised. And then that contrasts much more with the direct and participatory value uh, that you see on the behaviors inside. While the expressions, you see that there's uh, very similar expectations with expressionist techniques, um, with just subtle variations between whether or not it was structured or unstructured play. And out of all of the, out of the 48 parameters, there was only six that was interpreted generally wrong out of all of the participants. And five of which is the, either the subjective value of the image, whether you thought it was informative or aesthetic. Um, and the other ones are the, the way that I organized the method itself. So for me, in the conclusions, it, my project overall, it delivered on its original aims and, aims and objectives. It showed that design thinking could be a useful method in the research, development, and evaluation of photography projects. And as, a and as an approach, it becomes human-centered in its engagement and application. But I also had to recognize that it's uh, also a very under underdeveloped area of study. It's, so therefore there are uh, limitations, not least partially because it's um, certainly in the case study, it's self-qualifying um, and it's very much validating my own approach to photography all these years. But it should also be considered a starting point for further research uh, rather than a conclusion in itself. So for me, it actually gives what I would say a mission to advocate design thinking within photography. Um, to follow up I, uh, with ideas that were conceived throughout the rest of the course, not just this project. Um, so that includes things like the uh, artist residency canvas and the, and the image equalizer. Um, to encourage and assist in practice-based use of design thinking in photography. To keep, uh, to keep testing the equalizer with new bodies of work that I might develop. Um, and also to initiate further studies such as in the use of process models. Um, like the double diamond, for instance, and see if there's any correlation with process models that we see in design and other design thinking tools. And since completing my studies, I've, uh, and having a much needed rest afterwards as well, um, I've been laying the foundations for that. So from my own point of view, my, my business has been reframed uh, where its slogan now is as a space where photography meets design. I'm preparing to release uh, some of those uh, exercises and activities or resources, such as the, the, the residency canvas over the course of this year. And at the moment, I'm just drafting the necessary legal disclaimers that you need to have with uh, anything that you make open source, but based on a professional context. Um, and more, more surprisingly for me, it's also given me a chance to consolidate design knowledge um, and it's opened doors to write about design thinking in other contexts that I work in, um, such as uh, recently writing a co-author in an article with, um, with a, a friend and colleague 
who works with a, a company, a, char a charity in the UK who work in uh, prisons. They did specialize in art therapy in prisons. Um, and we found some correlations between design thinking and impact measurement surveys, that the journey of uh, design thinking uh, or how projects feel uh, correlates quite well with the, the, the uh, course journey that uh, prisoners are taking with, with Rise Up as well. And one of my next potential areas of research is to look at with my uh, photography accreditation body, the British Institute of Professional Photography, to see if design thinking principles can be identified in professional contexts. Much of this project was based in a much more, um, let's say, either non-commercial or artistic uh, circles, um, but to see how it works in industry as well through a series of, say, interviews and potentially case studies as well. So at this point, I will say thank you to everyone to attending so far. And I think we can open up the talk for any questions or feedback, if that's okay. Yes, thank you, Bryn. I don't know if anyone has any questions, but before that, let me just thank you for sharing your work and for sharing your insights with us today. I can say for me, it has been a very informative and insightful time. It's, it's truly interesting to understand a bit more about this broad world of photography. Uh, okay, we have Joel here. He says, really interesting. I thought the ideas around failed images and the observation method equalizer were fascinating. Yes, thank you, Joel. Does anyone have any questions? They can, they can. Brin can answer. Thank you so much for the insightful insight, the wonderful insights. Thank you for sharing with us your experience and your knowledge. I have a question if I may. Brin, thank you for your presentation. It was a remarkable work and very interesting. Um, my question is about your equalizer. If I understood correctly, is this observation method equalizer a tool that you developed during the project and that you are still using for different um, work that you developed? Yeah, so I developed this during um, for, for LSDM people, uh, ADP. It was part of it, within it. That's the, the final project, this, uh, this, this major project. Um, yeah, I, I basically used this project uh, to do two things, well, uh, well three things. One was to, uh, to bring design thinking into the contextual theory, to develop my own tools, uh, design thinking tools um, that are applied specifically for photography, and then obviously uh, give a learning pathway through a, an existing pro through a project that I developed in real time. The, the image equalizer, yeah, that, that's the, uh, as I mentioned before, the genesis of that was actually seven or eight years ago um, because I was actually, um, in the space of just a couple of weeks, I was in, a art, in, an, in an arts um, festival, a uh, public arts festival, uh, where I produced one body of work. And then a couple of weeks later, I was actually uh, doing my qualification panel with uh, the industry accreditation body, the BIPP. And it was like a yin yang, basically, that uh, first of all, that I did two very different bodies of work. But what was interesting was that um, the, the, the people who liked Project A in, in one zone had a completely different tolerance even of the other side. And uh, what, what I realized from that point was that um, photographers tend to have, let's say, personal projects and then things that you get paid to do, and that is marketed in very different ways. But people don't often talk about how they adapt their approach um, to suit the agenda. And because I, because I kind of feel out of place, I'm not a professional professional all the time, but I'm also not an artist. As I say, I think like a designer. My thought, about, my thought towards that is like, if you think of it from a, create, a design perspective, you would basically be calibrating for context. And then as a result, I, I wanted to come up with the kind of analogy that you could see. If we think of something like music, 
um, you know, there is where and where the graphic equalizer comes from. The yeah. the scale of the scale of that actually is very much, you know, the genre of music encourages different frequencies. So can a photographer actually use the same mentality when they are photographing? You know, can they can they turn off their brain of break you know all the rules that they've been taught? Yes, for the sake and of something that is more abstract and, and vice yes. versa. Um, and this, and when, while I was developing this project, it just gave me an opportunity to formalize that. And that was largely through um, the literature review, which was where, where I was able to identify the keywords, which were largely uh, uh, complementary opposites um, that you have. Um, and, and to use it in, like I said before, in a, in a lateral way, that one is not regarded as superior than the other. It's just if it's relevant to the, you know, in, in music case, you know, if it's, rap needs this and rock needs this you know to to be amplified in the right way so in the case of photography can you judge it that way because at the moment the the most frequent or most regular feedback that you get at the moment is likes and comments and that and and that is very much subjective and largely you know self gratifying bias yes <laughs> as a, and and has a bias and, and and at the end of the day beyond i like it i don't like it there isn't anything that that is uh, contextualizing that and you can actually see the difference i think it's actually in my main project where in the thesis itself i compare a nasa image to a photo to a, a photographic artist's image and it's basically the same thing it's a snow landscape but one is a satellite image of antarctica and um and and it's been you know, photograph for visual research, scientific data point of view. And the other one was uh, taken on a film camera and processed onto, and um, yeah, printed onto uh, Korean, uh, handmade Korean paper. And they look almost the same image aesthetically, but they are polar opposites in their context. So if you can get past whether or not you like the image and what was it designed for and what was its purpose and what was the le level of engagement, you can critique the image in a more, uh, not so much, uh, you can allow subjectivity, but then you get this consensus of what is, what is the frequency that the image is communicating. Because behind photography itself is it's a method of visual communication, just so much as, as graphic design or illustration is or something like that as well. Okay, thank you. I don't know if someone has more there is someone with questions, Shania? I don't think that we have any more questions in a chat. I was going to, to read the message that Laura left us in the chat for Samir, but I think Samir left. Oh, so. Samir is becoming a student. Also, Breen, I have one more question, but I, I think the answer needs to be very quick because we're almost finishing so it's almost six no just the final question it was regarding the research that you did because uh you had to do some um research and there's not a lot of papers talking about design thinking and photography and the intersection of that was it was this a challenge for you how did you tackle this yeah so uh it was the opposite of research in the memorial which has hundreds of people telling you that it's the best thing ever or it's it's a crime against humanity or and then everything in between um yeah the, i think the thing the thing that i uh had to approach it with was um to to obviously give the pro the 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 appraisals and the critiques of design thinking um was the first part so what is it so what what are we trying to connect photography to um to highlight the very little uh, connection between design thinking and photography. Uh, there was only one paper I found and it was about visualizing food, um, I think it was. Um, but then it was, a you, it was a chance to also again find some commonalities between um, academic visual research, how people work with our art and scientific research. Um, and, then and then finally bringing that together with uh, the fact that a lot of people in the photography debates now are also getting tired of the debate. Uh, you know, there was a quite a common theme that people are tired of talking about representation, uh, that uh, how, how the medium now is much more accessible to everybody. 
Uh, and finally, that uh, we need you know, we we've moved past the, the 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 century of the technical photographer, and now we're in the century of the image, which is includes photography, but it's not only photography. So, giving people the tools to 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 deal with that, people were asking the questions, but there was no answers. So then that helped me to finish the research and say, well, this is how I do it at least. If there's more. Um, if, or if anyone wants to develop the discussion further, I'm, obviously I'm here. Um, but that, that was for me the starting point. Um, it's it's uh, exciting but daunting when there's no research there, of course. So you're kind of the pioneer rather than the, the, the add, adding to an existing discussion. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to read David's message here. It always amazes me, whatever the subject, there's a way of thinking or explaining a process and pathway to an end creation and very interlinked to all kinds of projects. Thank you, David. So if you. there are no more questions for Bryn, uh, I think we can end this masterclass here. I want to thank you, Bryn, once again for accepting our invitation to be here as a speaker. And to our guests and participants, I want to thank you all for being here and for joining us. I hope you have a, a rest of a great day and I hope to see you next time. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for everyone for attending and uh, appreciate all the positive feedback as well. Thank you. Thanks, Brent. Have a great day.